I'm normally casual. I mean, I kind of am casual. I'm wearing sneakers. <laughs> That's cute. Very cute. More water? Are you done? I'm, I'm done with that. Yeah, it's in there. All good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are rolling into another episode of the Candace Owens Show. America is changing. We are debating socialism and whether or not that is the right system to implement um, into our government and into our economy. Uh, we are seeing the schools take a dramatic shift. We're being told that kids are now able to choose their gender. There are riots. There are protesting. There's looting. The churches are changing, actually. I took a walk through Washington, D.C., and I have never seen such woke churches in my entire life. The LGBT flags are flying high. The Black Lives Matter logos are flying high. What is this world that we are stepping into suddenly in this country, which was supposed to be the land of the free? And who are the most vulnerable people inside of this changing dichotomy? I happen to think it's the children that are being raised in this society, um, raised in a society that I didn't grow up in. Um, new moms, especially. You guys know I'm a first-time aunt, uh, two nephews born during the coronavirus scare. And I wanted to actually invite a new mother onto um, my podcast, someone who has her own podcast called Relatable, which you guys should download and listen to. And she is al also the author of You Are Not Enough, and that's okay. Allie Stuckey, welcome back to the Candace yeah, Owen Show. Thank you so much for having me. So, so much must have changed for you in the last year. Yes. Becoming so a first time much. mom. Yes. Almost a year ago, it was last July. So, uh, it's really hard to believe everyone says that it goes by so quickly. And when you're in those first few weeks of motherhood, you're like, no, it's not. It's going by so slowly because you're not getting any sleep and you're stressed out and you're hormonal. And you're like, this is the hardest thing that I've ever done. And I don't think it's ever going to go back to normal. But then slowly but surely it does. And you get used to things and it goes by so fast. And then all of a sudden that little infant that they laid on your chest is, you know, a full grown toddler. And it has been really fun. What has been the biggest change for you? Uh, probably orienting your entire life around the well-being of, of another human. I think that that shifts your perspective on a lot of things, not just in your personal life, but how you see the world. Of course, that happens a little bit when you get married. As you know, as a, as a newlywed, you start um, putting the welfare of someone else before you, and that kind of self-sacrifice really matures you, and it also changes how you see the world. It goes to another level when you become a parent. You've never realized this kind of just heartbreaking love. I've heard it described as it's like watching your heart walk around outside your body. And that's exactly what it is. It's so hard to explain until you're there, but this just kind of uh, eager, eager heart aching love that you have for another human being and for their welfare, never have you felt before like you would lay your life down in a heartbeat for another human being as you as you do when you become a mom or become a, a dad. So that has just, I think, been the biggest perspective shift in, in thinking about politics um, through the lens of the next generation. I think it adds another level of intensity of caring about what's going on because it's not just you and what's going to affect us for the next, you know, 60 years of our lives, however long we get to live, but also what's going to affect your children and your grandchildren and the long reaching effects of the policies and the movements that are happening right now. So I think it's just um, not just a perspective shift, but also a widening perspective of everything that's going on that's given to you when you become a parent. So your daughter is about a year old? Yes. Okay, so I feel like the world has changed from the last time you were sitting across this desk from me yes. in an infinite amount of ways, especially right. in America. I mean, if you you and I wrote down that day, if we had written down that day, a list of the craziest things that we possibly thought could happen in America, we couldn't have come up with it. Not no. in a million wild imaginative years could we have come up with this, what we're actually seeing in the world today. And, you know, I'm just wondering, how does that impact someone who is bringing someone up in this world? Like, do, there has to be some level of fear yeah. um, of, is this going to be the America that we know? Is my child going to grow up in the America that I knew? Yeah, there certainly is fear. I would say that there was a lot of fear when she was born. And like you said, all the stuff that's happening right now wasn't even happening then. But I think a year ago, we probably thought it can't get any worse than this. Can't get any crazier than this. People are so insane. The truth is subjective. And how are we supposed to create any kind of healthy and free society based off of the principles that you know, a lot of people on the left are laying down for us. 
But now, I even since January and February, if we would have sat down in, in February and said, what do you think the world is going to look like in a few months? We would have said, oh, you know, debates with, uh, you know, the presidential election, things are probably going to be contentious. We would have thought it's just a replay of 2016. Little did we know all of the absolute insanity and how the world has turned upside down even more than it than it had previously. So you're right. There is a new level of fear and there are more concerns than I even had a year ago or a few months ago. But at the same time, I think being a mom has also just the time over the past year has has given me, um, has, has reminded me the importance of, of remembering that people are not placed on earth at the time that they were placed on earth arbitrarily uh, by God. So he intentionally and purposefully puts the generations when and where and how he does for a reason. And so, like I've said on my podcast before, like he didn't choose our birthdays arbitrarily or flippantly. Like he didn't say, okay, this sounds good. This group of people will might be good right there, but maybe not. Maybe they won't be able to handle it. I have to remind myself that he does things purposefully and with intention. And if he predestined us to be born when we were born, where we were born, have the abilities that we have, have the platforms that we have, have the marriages, the kids, whatever that we have, then the same goes for our children. And so it wasn't arbitrary that he made her birthday when it was and that he decided that she was going to live through this time. The same will be true for your nephews and for your kids. Um, It's on purpose. And if he equips every generation to deal with the problems that they are facing, just like he did for the greatest generation and like he's going to do now, then I have to trust that even if it's scary and even if we do see the end of American liberty in this great American experiment that we have all benefited from, that I have to trust that he is going to equip his people for whatever issues that we are going to face. I have to trust that and I have to hope in that. And I also have to remember that ultimately for the Christian, this world is not our home, that we I hope that America goes back and that we reroute and that we go the way of American liberty and and prosperity. But even if we don't, Jesus does promise that he is going to rule in perfect peace one day. And that is what I ultimately have to look forward to. Um, and, and that is the hope that I have to cling to or else I will spiral into fear. And um, that's not good for anyone. Wow. I think there are so many moms who needed to hear that. And I'm just like, I felt instantly relieved when you said that. And I think that is probably the best, most optimistic perspective that I've ever heard in all of this. And I get inundated all the time, you know, as you do with questions from people around the world. And one thing that I see um, recurring a lot, especially in moms, is they're they're really fearful about the direction that the school systems have taken. And we saw this obviously happening. You and I have done a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of public speaking about this. Um, What would be your advice to them as a mother now, you know, you're you're much more tethered into the discussion about what they should be doing with their children, even not even just in grade school, because that's how young the indoctrination can start, but even through to college, what would be your perspective on that? Well, what I think parents need to realize, and I know I'm a new mom, so I'm not trying to say, oh, I have all the wisdom for, you know, the moms with five kids, with teenagers and things like that. I understand I have very limited experience. Thankfully, I have sisters-in-law. I have uh, a lot of women in my life who have a lot of children, have a lot of experience that I've been able to to learn from. And just from uh, being engaged in the culture like you are, have been able to see some of the trends that you're talking about. I was interviewing someone the other day who um, said something very poignant and true that the, the the battleground of ideas doesn't start in middle school or high school or college like we used to think it does. It starts on the playground. Mm-hmm. It starts when they're three years old. It starts at preschool. It starts uh, in the nursery rhymes that they are listening to and the things that they're watching on Netflix. There's an ideology that is being pushed behind so much of the content and the conversations um, that are surrounding our young children. So my encouragement to moms, especially Christian moms, that's just the perspective that I have, is start preparing your kids, your babies, your toddlers right now. Read them the things that you want to read them. Start teaching them about the Bible, about God's word, about who created them, who created the heavens and the earth. Start laying that foundation right now and I can talk about it at a different time or provide in a different way, different resources that I think moms can be using. But just make sure that right now, especially when your kids are at home before they are gone for eight hours a day at a school, to make sure that you lay the groundwork for the Christian values or whatever your values are for your children. Start shaping their minds right now so that they're equipped. My other piece of advice that I would have, again, as an inexperienced mom, but as a mom who sees what's happening in government schools, get your kids out of government schools. Mm -hmm. There is 
is um, a, a wonderful pastor by the name of Vodi Bauckham, and he has talked about just the indoctrination that happens in public schools. And he says, uh, you know, you can't send your kids to Caesar and be surprised when they come back Romans. And it's true. When you send your kids to government schools with a government ideology, which happens to be a left-wing ideology so much of the time, they are going to they are going to be affected by that and possibly infected by that. And so the question for the parent is, do you want to battle with that? Like, do you want to battle with the ideology that your child is learning for eight hours a day when you spend two hours at home with them at night? Probably not. Now, I know that there are a lot of teachers out there who are wonderful public school teachers, and they are doing the Lord's work. Like, I couldn't do it. So thankful for the wonderful public school teachers out there. Uh, but for parents, if you have the option, if you can do private school, if you can do charter school, if you can do homeschool, which is very cheap, by the way, there are a lot of parents on a low budget that do homeschool. If you can do that, to try to affect your child's worldview as much as possible, teach them to think critically and think biblically, uh, then get your kids out of government school. You're not doing them any favors by sending them on the front lines uh, when they are five and six years old to try to defend the worldview that you were teaching them. Um, keep them at home and keep them under your care and authority for as long as you can to prepare them for the craziness that's out there. And what if you can't? What if you're in a, a circumstance, you know, you're a single parent, uh, this right. is, you know, you you work all day, you got to send your kids. And this is this is kind of the trap that the government perfectly uh, provides for a lot of, you know, yep. impoverished families is you were basically your daycare, yeah. right? Um, what if you can't? H how do you combat your child going into a kindergarten class, and this is actually the circumstance in some schools where they are allowed to call your child by a different gender all day, and they're right. not required to tell the to parent. Tell I can't wrap my head. To me, that is Satan, right? Yeah. Satan is the author of lies and deception. And yeah. when I look at the face of this trans movement and this trans agenda and confusing kids, kids are already confused about everything, you know what I mean? And our job is to tell them what the truth is. Um, and when I see that, I think this is actually satanic. And I just don't know what we say to those parents who can't afford yeah to take their kids yeah. out. There might be a variety of factors that play into that, and I don't pretend to know, you know, every family situation. Uh, thankfully, the Trump administration has done a lot in the way of school choice and charter schools, and I think that that is excellent. But say in the meantime, if you can't send your kids to a charter school, you have to send them to, um, to a public school. I think that you just have to be all the more vigilant in teaching your children every second that you are with them, reminding them of what you believe and why you believe it. And that's going to require a lot of parents who maybe they feel like, oh, well, you know, I'm unequipped. I don't know that, that much about the Bible, but I know I want my child to, but I don't know where to start. I don't want parents to be intimidated by that. In order to teach your children and have an effect on your children, we do not have to be perfect or have all the theological biblical knowledge in the world or have read every book. You start where you can and you invite your your children into that learning process with you and you do the best you possibly can. And of course, we believe that God is totally sovereign. Like he is in control of your child. He loves your child more than you love your child. He cares for your child more than you care for your child. And so even if your child is at public school, you can still trust God. You can still, still do everything you can to mentor and influence your child for the Lord. There are people, I went to a private school my whole life, private Christian school. There are people who I graduated with who are the most so-called privileged people in the world who think that, who have completely abandoned you know, the oppressive Christianity, oppressive conservatism and traditionalism and things like that have abandoned their faith and have completely gone, uh, you know, down the road of leftist ideology. So that's possible too. Parents should know that private school does not guarantee that your child will go to college and stay a Christian or stay a conservative. There are people who go to public schools who graduate and are conservative and Christian. And so understand that, that of course, it is not just this like, uh, perfect binary, that really the responsibility, the onus is always going to be primarily on the parents to shepherd, to mentor, and disciple your kids as best as you can. All right. Well, you wrote a book, and I first and foremost love the title. Thanks. Uh, you Are Not Enough, and then in parentheses, and that's okay. Let's just talk about the title. Yes. So it's You're Not Enough, and that's okay, escaping the toxic culture of self 
love. Um, so the reason why I picked that title, and I talk about it obviously in the book, but we hear all the time, especially young women, you're enough, you're enough, you're enough. Now, how that jives with everything we're also hearing about hating your whiteness, I don't really know. The same <laughs> people are saying that. It just kind of shows you the logic of any kind of like worldly worldviews. But we are told by these self-love, self-help gurus that you're enough, you're perfect the way you are and who you are deep down is really perfect and flawless. And the only reason you feel insecure is because society has told you. Who's society? We don't know. But society, the patriarchy, capitalism, they've all told you that you're imperfect. But if you just throw off capitalist, uh, capitalistic ideas, if you throw off societal standards, if you throw out you know standards of, of beauty and health and things like that, you will be able to love yourself, which means you will be able to accomplish your dreams, which means that you will finally be fully satisfied and confident. And what we see in a lot of these self-help and self-love gurus is that their lives aren't fulfilled. Like their lives aren't fulfilled. And the people who follow this self-love mantra that says, if I just love myself more, I'll finally be happy and satisfied. They continue to struggle with insecurity and their own self-worth and their own happiness and purpose and fulfillment and commitment and all of that stuff. And so really the premise of the book is that that's because if the problems that exist are inside of you, like if you struggle with insecurity, if you struggle with fear, depression, anxiety, then the solution can't also be inside of you. If the self is the problem, it can't also be the solution. And then of course my counter is that God shows us a better way. He shows us a better way than self-love. God's love is so much better than self-love. And the argument is not self-deprecation. The argument isn't that you should hate yourself. It's viewing yourself the way God sees you as made in the image of God and created for his glory and the purposes that he has for you, which happens to be glorifying him and serving and loving other people. So it's a kind of self-forgetfulness and a self-denial that God offers us that really uh, brings us to the true freedom and satisfaction that these self-love gurus are trying to find and are failing. Right. And it's, it's interesting because you do see that and hashtag self-love all over, all over Instagram and women that are putting up pictures of themselves themselves overweight, obese, shaving their heads is all supposed to be a symbol of how much they love themselves because they no longer bend to the will of society. But then when you actually look into the lives of these people, they're tremendously angry, trem you know, tremendously hateful. They're obviously not happy. Um, and we've seen this sort of self-love movement sort of manifest itself in what today is modern feminism. I think we need to call it something else because it's not feminism. It's something entirely different. Um, and and it's, it's toxic. It's toxic for the individual. And if people that are young don't figure that out early. Right. They end up in a very bad circumstance because they actually um, put their hand up and they say no to things that could bring them so much love and so much gratitude, like religion, right? I mean, like Christianity, yes. like a husband, like I yeah. said to you, like my whole life I thought getting married, oh, wait, wait, it's going to be horrible. It's a, it's a kind of, um, yeah. it, it's like you're, you're going to be bound by marriage. And these these systems are, they're, they're so beautiful. They bring you such beauty and I can't wait to become a parent. Yes, exactly. Um, it is worshiping the, the God of self. And this is kind of what happens in all societies when you reject the God of the universe, when you decide, no, there's nothing bigger than me. There's no truth bigger than my truth. There's no reality bigger than my reality. There's no love bigger than my love. Um, you start to worship yourself. And self-worship means that you can't have any relationships that are hard. You can't have any sacrifice that's inconvenient. You can't have any morality that disagrees with the things that you want to do. Because if you worship a God, you do the things that that God wants you to do. And if you worship the God of self, you're going to only do the things that the self wants you to do. So that's why anyone who comes along and says anything that you believe is wrong or immoral or unbiblical, well, that is an affront to you. That is heresy. That's It's what I call the cult of self-affirmation. That's what all of this stuff is. It is uh, feeds on the worship of the God of self. And it, what, what we find out is that the self is a really bad God. We're really unmerciful gods. We're really ungracious gods. We are uh, unable to satisfy the insatiable needs of the God of self. And that leads down, like you said, this toxic road of selfishness in which people are constantly trying to find happiness in places where 
They just can't find them. Right. And you know what's interesting? And I always say this because I know a lot of people that listen to my podcast, you know, maybe they're not religious, maybe they're not Christian. And you focus a lot on Christianity in your podcast, which is great. Um, you know, I am a Christian and I try to just tell people, if, even if you're not a person that is religious, you can get something out of the Bible. The Bible, I mean, it's just the wisdom. It is timeless. And actually, I was looking up how many times the Bible mentions idolatry, warns us against idolatry. And I was looking at this because I was thinking about now how all of a sudden we have seen um, the idols um, of Hollywood suddenly speaking out and telling people how they should think. Right. And I had never grown, growing up, because I used to be crazy fans of this person, crazy fans of that person, I've sort of rinsed myself of saying that I'm a fan of anybody anymore because I realize this is a form of idolatry and we are seeing that manifest right now in society. When someone like Taylor Swift thinks that she can write a post and say, I'm going to get every single person to do this. I mean, what do you mean you're going to get every single person to do this? You're, yeah. you're a once country, now pop singer. And for the people that follow that, right, who follow that ideology, the young girls who go, yes, 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 Taylor Swift said I have to do this, so I do it. I mean, that there is something that is really, really wrong about that. Yeah. We are seeing idolatry, idolatry play out today um, via Hollywood. Right. And how unsatisfying is it to worship someone who doesn't know your name, who doesn't care about you, will not shed a tear if you live or die? And that's what happens with these people who worship someone like Taylor Swift or any celebrity who, you know, I'm sure they care about the people in their lives and all of that good stuff. But how deeply unsatisfying is it for us to make those our idols? And not only because they don't know you, they have no personal relationship with you, and they can do absolutely nothing for you, unlike the God of the universe, but also because we see the moral framework for their own lives and the ones that they're prescribing for other people are so flimsy. They're constantly contradictory. Like Chelsea Handler, for example, who you have brought up, like for someone who talks about, you know, feminism and empowerment seems like a very unhappy person. Mm -hmm. Well, she posted not too long ago a video of Louis Farrakhan and be saying, you know, wow, this is uh, this is really powerful. Like, I really agree with what he has to say. I learn a lot. Just look at how flimsy her moral framework is. That one day she's talking about the evils of oppression and racism, and the next day she's a uh, posting uh, posting a video of a guy who literally said that Hitler is a great man and who calls uh, Jews uh, a termites. And so just think about how contradictory their worldview and their moral framework is, and you will see why it is so dangerous to idolize people who don't even don't even know right from wrong in their own lives. Yeah, I mean, and I want to be careful in saying this, but I really do believe now, and not every single person but the entire institution of Hollywood, there's something very satanic about it, you know? I mean, bringing these people to the big screen, making them believe that they're gods, and, and they they believe that, you know? Sending paparazzi to follow their every single move, like, oh, ja, stars, they're just like us. They went to pick up an ice cream cone. Oh my God, I saw uh, Lindsay Lohan uh, getting an ice cream cone somewhere, you know? and and. There's a part of me that feels really bad for them. So, you know, I want to be careful in saying that. I, I, I sense the sadness in them. I sense that they, they, they never really can truly feel happy. And you see that in the way that their relationships always fall apart. They're angry and they're bitter. The major By the way, I'm speaking of, about a majority. Of course, there are some examples of people who have somehow survived the Hollywood vein. Um, but I, I do see something about Hollywood that I have just more and more been like, I really want to distance myself from this idea of the celebrity, the star. Um, and I, I, I just see a lot of like, Satan in that, you know? Yeah, I hope that a lot of people feel that same way. And I think that the more transparently we see these stars, the more they're on Twitter and the more they're showing us who they really are and their true colors and a lot of their hypocrisy, that a lot of people are thinking, okay, well, this person who seemed so far off and so godlike and so perfect and flawless, they're actually seeing them up close and realizing, oh, you're just a, a person and you have a lot of flaws and actually you seem really confused and unhappy. Maybe I shouldn't idolize you at all. So I think that is actually really healthy. My desire though is for people obviously, like you said, not to idolize celebrities, also not to idolize ourselves and to realize that there is only one God who is worthy of worship, who doesn't change. That's really one of the most comforting things I think about the character of God is that the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And with everything that is changing constantly, people's opinions, people's moral views, uh, people's social views, everything that is constantly changing, the reminder that Jesus is steadfast and that he does not change is a great reminder that he is the only one worthy of our worship. The satisfaction that people are looking for when they look to celebrities to worship or look to themselves uh, for worship, the satisfaction and the, and the love and the joy 
and the freedom that you guys are longing for, it's not elusive. It's not a mystery. Like it's found in Christ. If you are looking for those things, he's right there. Um, and so, but it, we just keep saying, oh, no, 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 no. It's probably Chelsea Handler. Like, oh, no, 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 no. It's, it's probably myself. Well, you're going to keep on getting disappointed. Do you think that um, they mean well? Do the celebrities, celebrities mean well? Probably. I think so. Now, you could argue that especially a lot of the stuff that's going on race-wise, and there have been, a, I think even Malcolm X would say this, there have been a lot of black activists that say this, that a lot of the things that people, um, that white liberals do, and especially white celebrities do in the way of trying to elevate black voices or to um, help the black community is really for themselves. It's, mm -hmm. for, it's for their own elevation. It's to show, hey, I'm compassionate. It's to signal to everyone that, hey, I'm I'm really inclusive. There have actually been some very, what I would say, radical activists, uh, black activists call out someone like Chelsea Handler for making money mm -hmm. off of the documentary she did about being a better white person. Well, you're still exploiting the pain and the suffering and the discrimination against black people by doing that as a white woman. And so I think that there's a lot of that. Now, I won't say that about every celebrity. I mm -hmm. think probably a lot of them have very soft hearts. I mean, they're all artists and so they feel a lot. And so I think they genuinely are compassionate it and you know maybe Chelsea Handler too but uh, no. not to, I feel like I've singled her out a ton <laughs> sorry I watched your show in in high school and I really liked it but I know I don't know what happened I was I, I, I was such a fan of hers there you go <laughs> but anyway um I do think that you know of course there's a lot of selfish ambition behind uh, a lot of that stuff and it's not just in Hollywood it's everywhere people signaling their virtue for the sake of their you know that's what the black squares were signaling their virtue for the sake of uh you know, showing other people that you're a good person and not caring one lick whether or not it is going to help that woman who just lost her business because of the riots in Minneapolis. You know, what's interesting, though, about the black square culture is that, you know, when I posted my video and my perspective about the George Floyd thing and it went viral, I had so many celebrities message me. Really? Celebrities who said, I totally agree with you. Um, you know, this is so true. I can't say anything. And then I'd go and I'd click to their profiles and they posted a black square. Yeah. Right. And I'm sitting here thinking, I know that you don't agree with this. So why are you posting a black square? And one of them said to me, because I'll lose my I'll lose my job if I don't. I have to pretend. And there was actually a a witch hunt going on. I say that right now we're living uh, you know, through through the the racist witch trials. Like yeah. you know, this is just like the single yeah. witch trials, but it's like the racism witch trials where it's like they look for anything as a sign that it means that you're a racist. If you don't post a black square, that's enough for them to, you know, to nail you to the cross and say you are a, a racist individual. And so it, it almost makes you wonder like how many of them actually believe it yeah. or has it become something where this is what they have to do, this is what they have to say in order to survive yeah. in this crazy realm of Hollywood or anybody. I mean, they're getting fired. I mean, are you reading these stories? Left and right, old tweets. Um, if you got into an argument now, which is one of the more bizarre things, um, I saw uh, someone, uh, who who's Meghan Markle's best friend? Jessica Mulroney. I don't really know I what know, she I does. Do. <laughs> yeah, But she literally got fired from her job and she wasn't the only one because she got into an argument with the black person. Nothing to do with race. It's just like you could have a squabble with anybody at work. Yeah. But now it's like Candace and Allie get into an argument and it must have been because Allie was racist. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a scary environment for, I think, white people to grow up. I mean, that's just like, that's scary. You have to always be nice. You have to always be wrong. You have to always apologize. Take out your cell phone, even if it's completely reasonable for you to be freaking out. If you freak out, it's Ali Stuckey freaked out on Candace because Candace Owens is black and Ali Stuckey's white. Yeah, and Ali Stuckey is a Karen, which has yeah. totally <laughs> become like a racial slur nowadays, no matter what someone is doing. The funny thing is, is that like, I'll get people who go out of their way to come to my profile to tell me that I'm doing something wrong, which I'm pretty sure is the definition of a Karen, but because <laughs> I am, you know, like a white Christian who is a conservative and talking about these things, they come and they say, okay, Karen, well, I'm going to report you. Really? Because I'm pretty sure you just asked to talk to the manager. Right. So <laughs> who's really the Karen here? But it's really just become like this racial slur that it is. So there's someone, actually, I already quoted him in this interview, but Vodi Bakum, he talks about something called ethnic Gnosticism. So Gnosticism, the idea that you are revealed special knowledge. So you as an ethnic, ethnic Gnosticism would say, you know about racism because of the color of your skin. I don't know about racism. So you can tell me exactly what racism is. I cannot argue with you. I can't say, no, I didn't mean that in a racist way. Like that's not what's in my heart. I don't mean that at all. No, I don't get to say that because you have the special knowledge because of your melanin count to tell me what is racist and what's not. I can never be contrite enough. I can never apologize enough. I can never make it right. 
because I said something that was perceived racist that wasn't actually racist. It's the same thing that, I don't know if you saw when AOC uh, came after Kaylee McEnany, the press secretary, because and she accused <laughs> oh, yes, her. I saw that. She yeah, ac- let's recap that in case there were yes, people who didn't see that. No, you go. Oh, okay. Well, Kaylee McEnany said from the podium, she said, you know, some congresswomen are calling for the abolition of the police and including, you know, a uh, Biden advisor AOC enlisted, I guess, Ilhan Omar and whoever else. And uh, AOC got very upset because I guess she just heard the Biden advisor part, giving her the benefit of the doubt. And she said, you know, this is a, a long tradition of white women <laughs> stripping people, women of color of their titles, just calling me a, a Biden advisor and not a con- congresswoman. Thankfully, Kaylee McEnany uh, tweeted back at her and showed her the cr- uh, transcript where she did say that AOC was a congresswoman. Well, this is liberal privilege that AOC was never asked to apologize. Mm-hmm. You can accuse someone of racism all day. It doesn't matter if it's false or not, this is an example of ethnic Gnosticism, of because of AOC's last name, because of her ethnicity, um, she is able to say that Kaylee McEnany meant something racist, even though she didn't say what a- what AOC said that she said, and that obviously wasn't the intention of her heart, but because you have a certain skin tone, you have this special revelatory knowledge, and you get to decide what is racist, what's not. We cannot have productive conversations, if we can't decide on an objective definition of what is actually racist, because if we can decide on that objective definition, then everyone that I know, conservative, Democrat, it doesn't matter, would say, yeah, that's bad. That's wrong to hate someone in your heart, whether it's the color of their skin or because of their age or disability or whatever. We can all agree on that. But if it's ever changing, if it's like, apparently white supremacy to say, you know, I think that the best person should get the job. If it's white supremacy to vote for Donald Trump, if it's white supremacy to believe in meritocracy and these things, then we're never going to be able to get along because you will never be able to bring someone over to your side just for believing things that are objectively true that you deem racist completely subjectively. Well, I've actually sort of been looking at it now and I've been trying to read all the stories and instances of alleged racism. And I think that I figured out what the newest updated definition of racism is. And it is anything that a black person does not like. So in my circle, broccoli is racist. I don't like particularly like broccoli. So broccoli, therefore, is racist. I can get on board with that. Like if racist. you want to protest, Any broccoli bad, is racist. Right? I'm totally broccoli with you. Any I'm bad an ally experience, in that. Like, Suddenly we believe that black people are not allowed to go through any any bad experiences, normal bad experiences. Everybody in the world can say that there's some employee they had, you know, a, a bad experience with, somebody that you exchanged words with, whether you're at a stoplight. F you, F you. If you said F you and that person that cut you off happened to be black, well, you said that because you were a racist. Yeah. And I've been noticing that trend and I'm going, oh my goodness. So now we're thinking that black people who are already so coddled by the mainstream media, right? We don't have to obey laws, even if, you know, we're grabbing a police officer's taser and, and punching him in the face. The police officer has absolutely no right to respond to that. Otherwise, the police officer is somehow a racist. You know, if he if, if he fires a shotgun, he's a racist instantly without, nobody's even asked, you know, you can say that a police officer did something wrong, but how do you know the intentions were racist versus just he did something wrong, right? right? So everything now suddenly gets assigned as racist. And, you know, Thomas Sowell has a, uh, you know, a sentence that he says a lot, which is that being black is not an intertemporal abstraction, uh, meaning, you know, the idea that being black what it meant to one person in the 1960s and that everyone was, every black person was having the same experience in the 1960s and now every person that's black in America today is having the same experience. That is in itself racist, right? So to say like, you know, this is what, all black people are going through. It's yeah. wrong. You yeah. know what I mean? Like you you cannot tell me. Some people might say, oh, I've had terrible circumstances with the police officers. I haven't. So does my experience not count? And maybe it's because I'm a law-abiding citizen. I don't, I don't try to fight police officers. I have not had that experience. So the fact that the mainstream media decides on a narrative that right. all black Americans are going through um, and we're supposed to get behind it. And if you're black, you have to then therefore hate the police. That yeah. is actually an example in itself of racism. And they would never place that kind of stress on white people. They would never say, this is what all white people, they do, white privilege. Right. Yeah. Um, but both of those things are just they're examples of racism. You know, how oh, can yeah. you p- paint such a broad stroke? Absolutely. And I've noticed this in the church, too, how a lot of churches and pastors have respond, have responded in trying to be on the side of uh, the woke in all of this. They will, you know, promote, OK, you know, white congregants like we really need to read some of these books. We need to read ta Coates like we need to read a uh, white fragility. We need to read uh, these things, which is written by a white woman. But we need to elevate the these black voices. And my question, I've reached out to some of them. Okay, that's fine. Like I am all for 
people reading, expanding their minds. I will read and watch things that I don't agree with. But why are you only promoting one kind of black voice? Like, why are you only promoting one side of this? Like, do you want to read? Uh, do you want to read Thomas Sowell? Do you want to read Jason Riley? Do you want to read John McWhorter? Do you want to read Walter Williams? What about those? My friend was actually telling me about a conversation that she was having with uh, uh, one of her friends who goes to her church, who is a social justice advocate, and her friend was trying to challenge her and my friends, because she listens to my podcast and probably your podcast too, was like, but you know, there are black people with other <laughs> perspectives than, than those people. And she said that her friend was shocked, that she had no idea what she was talking about. And my friend said, you know, like, this is the problem. This is the problem is that you think that black people are a monolith. You think that they all have the same reactions to everything. And it's just not true. And like you said, that's actually racist. There is no one more racist than the white liberal. But no one more racist than the white liberal. Totally well-meaning white liberal. Yeah, and I'd honestly, sometimes I wonder if they are well-meaning because it, to me, if you are well-meaning and you really think, okay, this is what I've been taught, which is totally plausible. This is what I've been taught. I assumed all black Americans are going through this. Well, then when you actually did encounter someone who disagreed with you, you'd be interested. Yeah. You'd go, okay, Candace, I actually want to hear what you have to say because I've right. never heard that perspective, but they don't. They get very angry. And what that says to me, if, if your response to seeing a black conservative or me saying, no, thank you, which I will actually do on my personal Facebook page. If somebody writes this long, sprawling, you guys know what time of year it is, where, where all the white liberals are now suddenly turned into like, you know, political science majors and they wipe these sweeping condemnations of their own skin, you know, and, and it's just like, it's such virtue signaling, right? Us white people need to do better. I mean, like who, I could never imagine saying that about myself. I could never apologize for being born black. So it's weird to see white people do this in general, but I will sometimes answer and I'll say, you know, no, thank you. You know, yeah. I disagree with this. Yeah. I definitely don't need you guys to all be doing this. You know, I need you to treat me like a regular person and not someone that needs to have their hand held because I do find it to be like rescuing a puppy. I find it to be very insulting. Yeah. And the anger that they come back with, it's either a block, an unfriend, uh, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, or or, or in, in the most extreme circumstances, you'll see people say, if you're a white person, you're sharing Candace Owens' videos, just know that you're further Girl, sharing. I have seen that <laughs> from people white from supremacy. my high school <laughs> just like, saying that. I'm like, oh my gosh. White supremacy. And I'm going, you know what that says? You're not a well-meaning white liberal. Right. You're doing it because you get off on telling your other white your other white friends that I'm I'm a better kind of a white person. Yeah. They like, know it, more about being black in America than right. the woman who but has been black, black in America. People. It's for... about going after people like you. It's right. saying I'm better than you, Allie, because I have this perspective. I'm more worldly. I'm more secular. I understand what's going on. Right. And it's really, it's a white on white crime. Right. You know right. what I mean? And if I say, okay, I have learned a lot from black scholars. Actually, I would say that m a lot of my theological and political views have been informed by people who happen to have a high melanin count. And I didn't seek them out because of that, but it's just because people like Thomas Sowell and Jason Riley and some of the podcasts that I listen to, they happen to be very sound and smart people. I'm like, I can give you a list of black resources. Like if you're interested in elevating black voices, I can give you a lot of black resources. If you're not willing to hear me out, like if you don't want to hear my perspective about racial stuff, that's fine. I don't know what it's like to be black. I can give you a list of resources. Nope. Yeah. No, they don't want them. They don't, they don't want those resources. They don't want that perspective. They don't want your perspective. It's about them. It's selfish. It's not about black people. It's right. truly about them. And that sort of gets back at what you're talking about um, in your book, which is just, you know, it's, it's, it's become, become a culture of me, 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 me. How do I make myself feel better? How do I elevate myself? How do I look at myself in the mirror and say, yeah, I'm so better true. than Ali Stuckey? And I see so much of that when I look at white guilt. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I a story that I saw recently, and I want to ask you, where does this go for the white Americans? Where does this end for the white Americans that have accepted this narrative, that are offering apologies, that are putting up black squares, that are making their children wear things like, you know, you see the little four-year-olds wearing, like, I'm aware of my white privilege, which to me is just absolutely so despicable. Sad. It's, I mean, just like, take the child away from this. I mean, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't imagine making my, my child feel guilty about being born black. That's just what really, yeah. I can't wrap my head around. But there was the instance of, uh, who's the glee girl, Leah? Michelle. Michelle. Did okay. you see that? Did you see what she got? She's canceled. She lost all of her sponsorships. And the story no. is just so absurd. So she did her virtue signaling, you know, Hollywood thing. And she tweeted like, we need to do more for black people, blah, 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 Black Lives Matter. And then some girl that she worked with on set happened, you know, who happened to be black said, are you kidding me? You were like such a B-I-T-C-H to me. Um, and I remember how awful you were to me, right? That was it. They just said that she, she was mean to her on set. And then a bunch of other girls, some of them white, uh, actually the majority of them white said, yeah, Leah's really mean to everybody on set, right? 
somehow that turned into Leah's a racist and mm-hmm. she got dropped. The, she, she never got a, accused of saying an N-word, never said anything. It seemed to me that it was apparent that across the board, Leah is not a nice girl on set. And I, I can totally buy that. She yeah. doesn't look like she's the ni- I mean, nicest girl in the entire world. But what, how does that turn into now she's a racist and she then issued a blubbering apology? Like, I am working, you know, I'm working on myself. I need to understand how I play into this. Yeah. And I'm thinking, why are you, apo- like, you can apologize for being like, I need to be nicer. But yeah. why are you biting on this race narrative and where does it end when white people keep doing this keep getting on their knees figuratively and literally yeah. in front of black people who just say I don't like what you did to me well it's never going to be enough and I think what we learned from the story that you just told is that okay it's so it's not equal treatment so it is unequal treatment mm-hmm. that we're wanting I mean maybe she is really a mean person but I mean she's probably equally mean to all people and so <laughs> I guess it's it's not equal treatment it is like I said disparate treatment you actually want inequality when it comes to treating people the same. And what we see, especially I would say in the church, that's just like the perspective that I have and the people that I follow and seeing is that um, some people believe that what Jesus tells us to do, that loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself is not enough. So it's not enough to just love your neighbor. It's not enough for me to be kind to you and to treat you as a friend, just like I would treat any of my other friends. Like that's not enough to serve people and to help people just like you would uh, any other person. You have to do special penance, I guess, and use special language. That's why a lot of people have claimed that the whole movement has become a cult because it mirrors in a lot of ways Christian orthodoxy in a penance, in repentance, in paying back, in um, holiness and obedience and things like that. But it is a graceless religion. It's a graceless religion. You can never pay enough for your sins. And by the way, it's not just your sins that you have to pay for and get down on your knees for. It is possibly maybe the sins of your great, 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 great grandparents who might have owned slaves. That's what you need to pay for. That's what you need to apologize for. You need to apologize for and pay for the things, for the privilege that you didn't even know that you had and that you've never even used to exploit a person of color. Like you need to apologize for that. And even then, it'll never really be enough. So my encouragement to people of all kinds, people of all skin colors, is to do what God calls you to do. Love your neighbor as yourself. You wanna make a difference in the lives of people? Go be kind to people, go help people, go pay for someone's groceries, go help feed people, deliver food to people, help the homeless people, no matter you know what their skin color is. Uh, go volunteer at an abortion clinic where uh, black, Hispanic, white women are walking in every day believing that the best option for them is to kill the baby in inside their womb. Uh, Go act like those lives matter by doing something. And don't worry about meeting the arbitrary, ever-changing standards of the woke, because you will never meet them. They will never be enough. God has already set the standard for you. Love your neighbor as yourself. No matter what their skin color is, you don't have to worry about the approval of the self-loathing woke liberals out there who, you know, their standards change from day to day. It's too exhausting to try to follow them. Well, I want to talk to you about the church because, I mean, I always say, you know, I'm a Bible believer and I'm a Christian. I have tons of issues with some of the churches, you know, and that you know started from the time that I was 11 years old. My, my grandfather was really strict about us reading the Bible every single day, but there were some issues with his church that I didn't particularly like. Um, and I've seen a lot of that. And when I walk around now today, What is this that we're seeing with churches that are pro-LGBTQ, churches that have Black Lives Matter, the fist and the flag, um, you know, waving high? We accept everybody here, which, you know, obviously that sentence, of course, at a church we accept everybody here, but you know what I mean, what they're implying when they have it behind um, an LGBTQ flag. Um, What's happening to the church? I mean, we're talking about abortion. There are pastors that are are okay with abortion. I mean, (laughs) you know what I'm saying? So what is happening to the church that we're seeing this, um, seeing it take a leftist turn? And what does that really mean for Christians? Well, it's progressive Christianity and the so-called church, and I say that in heavy quotations, the so-called church sounding more like the world rather than the world sounding like the church, how it should be. I mean, we're called to be a city on a hill, uh, light in the darkness, but really they're just adding to the darkness with more darkness cloaked in something that sounds like Christianity. 
but they don't believe what I think is the most controversial verse in the Bible, which is Genesis 1-1. God created the heavens and the earth. If God created the heavens and the earth, then he says what is and what isn't, what's true and what's false, what male and what female is, what's right and what's wrong. And if you believe God has authority over those things, then you also believe that he has the authority to define something like sexuality, like marriage, like gender. And that doesn't mean that you don't love those people and that you're not friends with those people and that you don't, uh, you know, serve those people. Of course, of course you do. Um, but you should be able to stand strong on the word of God because that is the basis on which we have our faith. And if you abandon that, then why even go to church on Sunday? That's what I always say. Go to brunch. Like there are better ways to spend your Sunday if you are going to learn the same thing sitting in a pew as you will if you read Cosmo mm. or if you watch MSNBC. And that's why actually there's one encouraging statistic, according to Pew Research, that progressive churches, what I call nominal churches, so Christian in name only, they are the fastest dwindling church. So they are the churches that are losing the most members because thankfully people are realizing, I can get this ideology anywhere. Like I can turn on CNN and hear the same thing as I'm hearing this so-called pastor preach to me. If the church is offering the same thing that the world is in the way of justice, in the way of truth, in the way of love and satisfaction, no one's going to go to church. But the churches that are actually standing strong, the so-called fundamentalist churches, which is not, a, it's not fundament, fundamental. It's just people who believe in the word of God, that God is authoritative, that he says what justice is. He says what, what right and wrong is. He says what love is. And it's so much better who actually preach the real saving grace of Jesus Christ, that you actually have to repent from your sins through his, uh, through his strength. Those are the churches that are staying strong. Those are the churches that are actually growing. And I've said for a lot of the Christians that are out there that are, you know, they're discouraged because they've seen a lot of churches go in the way of the woke, or they have, you know, capitulated on different social issues, whether it's abortion, whether it is, you know, some other social issue, is that the church, it, it thrives on the margins. And so, yes, we will see more persecution of the church. It will be harder to be a Christian. It will be less popular, less lucrative, less safe to be a Christian. Um, but really, that is the norm for most of Christian history and for everywhere else in the world, by the way. America has been insulated from that kind of persecution um, for the past few hundred years, and that is very rare, like in human history. And so I tell Christians, be ready, because the age of the cultural Christian is dead. It's gone. The cultural Christian will die off. It will not be popular anymore to just say you're a Christian, but not really live like it. And the church, the true church will be refined by fire, not destroyed by it. And the people who truly hold to the word of God and believe and serve Jesus Christ will be the ones left standing. And that is where the church becomes the city on the hill that we are called to be in America. So even though it's scary to face the kind of persecution that we're seeing and the infringements upon religious liberty and, and all of that stuff in the United States, the last beacon of liberty that exists, it's okay. Like this is where God shines through his church and he's got his church. We don't have to worry about it being destroyed. It can't be. I totally agree with you. And I said to my husband the other day, we were talking about how, you know, we what, we, what we're seeing play out right now in America really is a battle between good and evil, a battle between Satan, the author of lies and deception, and and, and the people of God. Um, and I, my biggest regret this year so far has been that when I paid my taxes and I realized that I could have given so much more to, a ch to our church, you know, and, and, and I really encourage people, you know, you can give it to the government or you can give it to a, a, a church. And if you can, I, these people, they need to spread the gospel. We need this more than ever. Um, and I'm seeing it every single day. Hey, you don't even have to go to a church to donate to a church. You just can decide whether or not you'd rather donate to the government or whether you'd rather donate to people like Ali Stuckey and, and people that are spreading the gospel. Um, so please, first and foremost, Download her podcast. It is great. It is relatable. You're on your iTunes right now, presumably. You're either on YouTube watching me or you're on iTunes. You can go scroll and find relatable um, and go get her book, You're Not Enough and That's Okay by Allie Stuckey. You guys know that we wrap every single episode by allowing Allie to leave a face message for the world. And we know that whatever she is going to say, it is going to be the gospel. And today is Sunday because that's <laughs> when my show comes out. So listen to this. On your mark, get set, world, I give you Miss Ali Sucky.
Okay, one thing that I will say, talking about generosity to your churches, I just want to echo what Candace said and how important that is right now. First of all, I encourage you to find a biblical church that is preaching the word of God, that is preaching the gospel. There are a lot of good resources out there. Go to foundersministries.com. They've got a church finder. You can enter your uh, zip code and you can find a good, faithful, biblical church around you. I do encourage you to donate uh, money to your church, even if you're paying a lot of tax, uh, a lot in taxes. There is a parable of the widow's might. She didn't have hardly any money, and yet she gave a lot of what she had, even though she was poor. And Jesus uh, praised her in that parable uh, for doing that. We give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and we give to God's what is God's. That's what Jesus tells us to do. And if you find a biblical church, um, yes, give your time, give your money, give your resources, get plugged into that church, because I know that a lot of you out there are feeling alone. Like you are alone in your principles, you're alone in your values, you're alone in your faith. And I'm here to tell you that you're not that there are millions of people who think like you do. Maybe they're not on social media. Maybe they're not as outspoken. Maybe they're scared, but I encourage you to find community. You don't have to agree on everything in your church communities, but find people who love God, who love their neighbor, who love God's word and want to obey him and want to work together for the advancement of God's kingdom and the good uh, of the gospel. Don't forget uh, to pray that the Bible says that the prayer of the righteous person has great power and how good is God that he has given us access to him uh, through Jesus Christ. And so I'm just feeling right now that a lot of you out out there are scared and you're feeling lonely and discouraged and just know that you are not alone, that you have a God who sympathizes with your weaknesses, uh, that knows the, uh, knows your burdens and knows your concerns and cares for you. And there are millions in the Christian church who are struggling and going through uh, the same things that you are. So uh, stay strong, continue to pray, continue to serve, continue to give, continue to be obedient. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself and don't worry about the rest. And that's all I have. Wow. And buy my book. <laughs> Literally two minutes. She's just so perfect. <laughs> Allie, you are incredible. Thank oh, you so thank much you for so coming much. on. Thank you guys for watching the latest episode of The Candace Owens Show. I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As many of you guys already know, PragerU is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which means we need your help to keep all of our content free to the public. Please consider making a tax-deductible donation today. I would really appreciate your support.